Hello, I want to welcome you to Life Church via the podcast. My name is Jennifer Eller and I am the Connections Team Leader. We are so thankful that you are watching this week's message. I would like to encourage you, if you live close by, to come and check us out on a Sunday morning. We have a great team of greeters who are ready to help you find your way around. Or check out the Plan Your Visit section on our website to see a glimpse of what a Sunday morning is like here. We can't wait to have you join us. Enjoy this week's message. Hi, good morning. Good to see everybody. All right, so we are on the last part of our series, What Happens One Minute After You Die. Now, for me, um, I think I've shared this with you guys before, but when I was younger, I had never really experienced death. Um, Most of my grandparents were gone before I ever knew them or had a relationship with them. And so for me, you know, I'd never experienced being close to someone and losing someone until uh, my mom, who was 51 years old, I was in my 20s driving down the road, you know, I get a call from the state police that she got dizzy, pulled over the side of the road and died instantly. And so for the first time, you know, um, as a Christian, I was like, the emotions of somebody you love, right, losing them was difficult for me. Like, I didn't get it. Like, I didn't understand it. My assumption was, you know, as a Christian that, you know, I would enjoy my family for a lot of my life. And then your parents grow old and they get to become, you know, grandparents and they get to be with your kids and all that stuff happens. Like, I just thought that's the way it goes. So this caught me way off guard. So dealing with it, if you can imagine, wasn't easy at first, but she had a twin sister And so her twin sister came up to me, uh, which was hard because they're identical twins. So if you can imagine that, you know, having an identical twin walk up to you, you know, as your mom is, you know, in the casket. And even to this day when I see her, I'm like, this is exactly what my mom would look like. And it's been 20 some years uh, since that. But anyway, so she came up to me and she said, I want to, she pulled me off to the side. She said, I want you to understand something. You say you were a believer in Christ, because at that point I was a youth pastor and she knew the stuff that I was doing. And she said, you say that you were a believer in Christ, how you handle this will tell us what you believe, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, what? who says that? Like right before, you know, a funeral, like who comes up and says that? But what I understood is she wasn't talking about like, don't be emotional, don't cry, don't be hurt, like, you know, put on a strong front. She was talking about what we've said from the beginning. This is what we've said from the beginning. What you believe about eternity determines how you live today. That's what she understood. She understood that my perspective of where my mom was going to spend eternity should affect the decisions I make for the rest of my life. Right? Like it should motivate me in the things that I do and all of the things of my life. And at first I didn't get that. Like at first I was just like, is she saying when people come through, I need to, because all of you guys that have been through that experience, like you're standing in the line and everybody comes through and they don't know what to say to you and you don't know what to say to them. You know what I mean? When you've been there, like you have no idea. It's like, you know, reliving memories and you're trying to go back and forth. And, you know, it's like, you know, hey, we can say, hey, you know, mom had the hope of heaven. We're excited to see her someday, which is all true. But what really mattered is what I did the Monday after and the Tuesday after and the Wednesday after. What did I do with my life, right? What, did, what decisions did I make inside of my life to be able to say that what I believed was going to change the actions of my life. And so today we're going to end with heaven, right? So the beginning we talked about understand that one minute after you die, everybody goes in front of the judgment seat. Then we talked about last week, which I think was difficult at times to talk about, but there is a real place called hell and there are people that are going there, right? And not necessarily for us all the time, people that we think should go there, right? Like there's good people, we know this. There are good people that have not done anything wrong by society's terms um, are going to spend eternity in hell because they didn't make a decision for Christ. So we wanted to end with, so what is heaven like, right? What what would it be like? Now, you know this, right? That that when you describe heaven, because I think first of all, sometimes churches struggle talking about heaven because they don't really understand it, and it's really hard to describe, so they just kind of leave it as, you know, whatever you think it is, it's better than hell, you know, so, you know, as long as you understand that heaven's better than hell, you know, make an educated decision, right, like that's what you need to do, but I think that, that the understanding of what heaven is um, will not only be obviously better than hell, but it's so much more beautiful, but we know this, it's really hard to explain just how beautiful, 
right? Hard to explain just how perfect that place is going to be. In fact, in Scripture, this is what it says. In 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 9, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, or no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who loved him. Now, some people will use that scripture and say, well, that's why you can never talk about heaven, because you can never imagine it, and, you know, nobody's ever seen it, and so how are you ever going to describe it? But there are other places in scripture that do describe what heaven is like and what we can look forward to. It's just know that no words inside of your Bible can describe how awesome it's going to be, right? Like there's no possible way we're going to be able to describe that. Now, to preface that, today we're going to talk about what's going to be the place where you're going to be forever and ever. So we're not going to talk about the intermediate heaven. So the intermediate heaven is what's there today, right? And then in this intermediate heaven, there are certain things happening. And at the end, when the earth is destroyed, there's a new heaven and a new earth. That's what we're going to be talking about. Okay. Otherwise, this would be a long session, right? So there is a heaven where people are right now, right? But there is a final destination, which is the new heaven and the new earth, right? Where we all are going to spend eternity. And so instead of trying to explain them both and not doing either one of them justice, at some point we'll talk about what happens and we have before what's in the intermediate heaven. But we're, what we're going to talk about today is what happens at the end. What's the final uh, destination and how does all of that work. So if you have questions, again, about the difference between intermediate heaven and the final destination, just write it on your connecting card and I can meet with you and we can talk about what the differences are. I'd love to be able to do that with you. All right, so the other thing that, that I want us to, to understand is that I know that there are people in this room in the same situation that I've been in, and that is you've lost someone close to you, right? That have somebody that, that's been dear to you or close to you that you've loved. And so the scripture that I want to read here in the beginning comes from John 14, 1 through 6, where he's talking to, for all of us that have to exist on this earth without the people that we love, right? Like, how do you handle it? Like, what are the things that you're supposed to do? So he says to us in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled, right? Which Again, when he's talking about that, he's not talking about like don't like buck up and don't miss your loved one. Like that's not what he's talking about. I think till this to this day, I still miss my mom. Right? And it's been twenty, I don't even know how many years ago, a long time. Right? And I still miss her. So I don't think he's saying, you know, just push through your emotions and never have emotions and never think about those things. What he's saying is this don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, to be with me that you also may be where I am. So the part of what he's saying is don't, don't be troubled, right? Because they are already in the place that I prepared for them, but don't forget you're coming too, right? So you know, you only have a short amount of time on this earth and know that, that uh, there's something yet to come with that. And he says, and he goes on, he says, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered him. And so he's saying, listen, if you want to be reunited with your loved ones, right? Like if you want your loved ones who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, your hearts won't be troubled if you know that you're going to see them again someday right? Like you're going to miss them. You know, there's not going to be a day that goes by that you don't think about them, but don't let your hearts be troubled because if you know this, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, then you too are having a place prepared for you. Does that make sense? That's why your heart wouldn't be troubled. If you've understood the way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and not through your good works, not through attending church, not through reading the Bible, not through doing religious activities, but the way to see your loved ones again is through Jesus and because of the things that he did for you. If you understand that, your room's being prepared, right? You're going to see them again someday. So don't let your heart be troubled, right? And then he goes on, and this is in 
uh, Revelations 21, where John, who wrote that too, but he wrote this uh, from the island of Patmos where he was exiled, where he got a vision from God of what was to come. So if you read the Bible, only one piece of scripture is futuristic, and that is Revelation. So if you read Revelation, it is what is to come. So when John was exiled to the island of Patmos, God gave him a vision of what you can expect in the future, right? So what's happening in the future. So here is what he tells him, and he's talking about our final destination, the new heaven and the new earth. So he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will, be, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the, older, for the, older, for the old order of things has passed away. He who has is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything know, new. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. So he's giving a picture of what's going to happen at the end, the new heaven and the new earth. And so here is my goal for, for this series and for this message. So I'm hoping that you will lose your grip or your desire or your um, holding on to this world, right? Like, I think we can enjoy this world. I think we can enjoy the functionality of this world. I think we can enjoy the things that God gives us in this world, but it shouldn't have a grip on us, right? Like, we should look at what is to come, right? We should be excited about what is to come, and I'm hoping that at the end of this that you will get a grip on or the hold or the thing that will be drawing you is what is to come, and that is heaven. So the way we're going to do that is do away with some misconceptions of what heaven really looks like. So the idea of today is saying, well, maybe you thought heaven was like, but this is what heaven is really like. Because I think the misconceptions, I don't think they're just with me, but I think that there's some that people see all the time. So we're going to look at three misconceptions. Here's the first one. Heaven will be boring, okay? Now, I'll ask this to you. Did anybody else ever think before they truly know, or maybe even, maybe you wouldn't admit this, but did anybody ever think like me that like hell's bad and heaven is better, but it sure seems boring? Anybody else think that? Come on. Listen, when I was a kid, this is how they explained heaven to me. So you sat in your Sunday school room, and this was the flannel board days. Anybody else grow up in a flannel board day? And so they put this line across it, and the bottom was hell, right? And they put up the devil with his horns and had a pitchfork and a person right next to the pitchfork like they were, you know, stabbing him. And then at the top of the line was this cloud with this guy in a white robe playing a harp, right? And he's like, this is heaven, and this is hell. And I'm like, I don't want to be stabbed with the pitchfork but I don't really even like music or a white robe. So like for the rest of my life, all I do is like sit on the cloud and play the harp. And like, I know I should want heaven, but man, that seems like a bummer, right? Nobody else. So I was just like that. For me, I never thought like, I don't want to really go to hell, but you know, I guess heaven's the default destination. And I guess floating on a crowd and never doing anything for the rest of your life would be better than going there. But I honestly thought that heaven was boring until uh, I read a book by Randy Al Alcorn. Uh, it's called Heaven. It's really thick. And in this book, he describes through scripture, right? Like this is the other thing. Nobody really talked to me about what's the Bible say about heaven. It's just like, oh, it's so indescribable. And it's got golden streets, which didn't, you know, I didn't think that was all that cool either, right? Like, I mean, I didn't think that was that neat. But then in the book, it talks about, like, this is what you're going to do. Like, you're actually going to have purpose, right? Like, you get to work, and you get to do things, and you get to be a part of things, and that, you know, here's what the heaven's really going to look like. I'm like, now that's exciting, right? Like, I could, I, I'm excited about what is to come. And so it changed my perspective that heaven is not boring. And if you want to look up you know, some things we're going to go through here and give you some perspectives of what it will be. So what it will be is we will know one another, right? So that's one thing. So you're going to know one another, right? So once you go to heaven, you will know one another and the, the emotion of love. So you will love 
and you will be loved. And so if you want to look this up, so just so we couldn't put all these scripture verses up there. So if you want to write this down, that's in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 through 13. So here's one of the things that you'll do. Like you'll recognize people. So when you get to heaven, the idea that, that when you get up there, you're not going to know anybody and you're just going to love everybody, you know, that was hard for me too because I wanted to know that I would be able to recognize my mom. Like I wanted that. I wanted to believe that that was true, but I never knew whether it was. Yeah, scripture's clear that when you go to heaven, you will recognize people. In fact, like for some of us, it'd be like you read all the Bible stories and you see all the great heroes of the faith. And so you're going to be able to talk to them. So the Abraham and Isaac and Moses and Paul and Peter and John, like you're going to be able to talk to all those people and ask them questions and, and sit down with them and have a conversation with them. And, and this is what I told you, and I can't wait for this day. I still think of this day. The day I go to the Bama seat of Christ and, you know, I go through judgment and he goes through the book of works. And then I walk through, I can just imagine this, that my mom and Chuck and all the people I love are just going to be sitting back there just, and can you imagine that? Like just welcoming you with the biggest hug that you've ever had in your entire life. The day that I'll be reunited with the people that I love, I can't wait for that day. And that I will recognize them and that all of the things, because I don't believe you could ever live your life and never have any regrets. Like I think you can say that. So all of the things that, like I regretted not spending more time with my mom. You know what I mean? We were busy and we had kids and, you know, I have all those things. So I regretted that I didn't get to do that and the thought that I get to make that up. Like I get to be with her. I get to, you know, nothing's going to distract it. You're going to be able to spend that time. You're going to be able to have those conversations. I think how incredible that will be to be able to have it. So you will recognize people. Here's the next thing. The next one, heaven will be a place of unimaginable beauty. So it's not just clouds, thank the Lord, right? So you're not just going to be on the clouds. It's going to be unimaginable beauty. And so the way that it's described, so one of the things that the book talks about is imagine this, that um, in the beginning, God created the earth, right, as a place to dwell with his people. So the idea of heaven, they like, if you want a, an idea of what heaven could be like, imagine the most beautiful places that you've seen on this earth because he created it like it was going to be the place he will rule with them forever, right? So if you want any idea what heaven's going to look like, you can look right around you, right? Like you can look at earth and get a picture. It's just sin has taken away part of the beauty of the earth. But I think about this, like when we went to Guatemala, we hiked to a place, and we hiked it so high up that there were places where the clouds would go through. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you're resting after a hike, and you're looking out the beauty of the mountains. Like, can it get any more beautiful than this? Yes, right? Like, it can get more, like, it can get way better than this. Heaven is going to be far beyond any beautiful thing that you've ever seen. But in your mind, you can wrap your mind around, yeah, there are going to be mountains. There are going to be trees. There is going to be nature. There are going to be, maybe your love is beaches. There are going to be beaches. There are going to be oceans. There are going to be, you know, those types of places. It's just all the thing that sin has done to the world will be reversed and it'll be even more beautiful, right? So it'll, it'll be unimaginable for us. So we can understand that the beauty will be incredible. The other one is this, that you will see Jesus face to face. Now, I know that that might not seem like that's that big a deal, but understand that, that nobody in scripture, when the glory of God passed by, nobody could look at God in the face, right? Like you couldn't look at him face to face because you would be killed by the glory of God. And so at this day, you get to see not only God, but you get to see Jesus and you'll be able to be with him face to face. Now I know my first thing that I'm gonna do I'm going to go up and give him a big hug and say, thank you. Like, I can't believe you forgive me. You know what I mean? I can't believe that you did all of that. Like, I can't wait for the day. I know there'll probably be a big line. It'll be like going to the amusement park, right? It'll be the one thing that's like four hours that I won't mind waiting for, right? Because of all of the people that, that are going to be there. But I want to be there. I want to personally walk up to the person that made it possible for me to be forgiven. And I want to say thank you because I didn't deserve it. You know what I mean? His death on the cross and the things that he did, I didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. And so I can't wait to the day where I can walk up to him and just personally say, thanks for saving such a loser like me and giving me the chance to be able to serve you for the rest of my life. So I can't wait to be able to see uh, Jesus face to face. The other one, and this didn't matter as much when I was younger, but it seems to matter more now. You will have new and perfect bodies, right? Like, 
when you're younger, that doesn't seem to be that big a deal. But as you get older and things start to fail and not work quite as good as they, they used to. So uh, we went up to the lake for a short period for Brady's birthday yesterday. And so they wanted me to do wake surfing. I don't know if anybody's seen wake surfing. I can't get up on a wakeboard, but Lexi was convinced, like, oh, you can get up and you can surf. So I couldn't believe this, but I actually did get up. But I'm like three minutes into it, and I'm like, I'm about ready to die. My legs hurt, my hamstrings, my hamstrings still hurt this morning, right? And I'm like, I can't believe how out of shape I am, but my body just keeps going backwards, right? Now, I could probably have a little bit to do with keeping it, you know, in, in better condition. But you just don't realize, right, like all of the things, like your body every year, whether we like it or not, is going backwards. So someday you're going to have a new and perfect body and all of those things uh, will go away. The other one is this, is that heaven is the absence of everything bad, painful, and evil. And it's, uh, it's the presence of everything good, holy, and glorious. Now, for me, probably more in the last 10 years, this has made sense to me. Like the heaviness of the world, sometimes I'm just ready to go. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like some of the tragedy, some of the heartache, some of the pain, some of the difficulties of just doing life, you know, and the thought that all of those things, because I've watched people suffer, I've watched people be in pain, I've watched tragedies happen on this earth, and I'm like, you know, just the, the heaviness of all of that, that someday all of that's just going to go away. Someday those things aren't going to be that way anymore. Someday the, the weight of sin and the heaviness of the world, and the pain and suffering that, that we experience, someday all of those things are going, to be God, or are going to be gone. So we understand heaven's not boring, right? And we could go into a lot more detail of what you're actually going to be doing there, but we don't have time today. Heaven's not going to be boring, and all of those things are a list just to give you a, a brief glimpse of the excitement that's going to happen in heaven. The next misconception is this, that the world is your home, right? And I think we all know this. Right, that one of Satan's greatest deceptions is for you to believe that this is your home, right? Like this is your final destination. Get everything that you can out of this life because this is all you have. And what we need to understand is what Scripture says. Here's what Scripture says. Their mind, meaning people who don't yet know Jesus Christ, right? Who don't understand the eternity to come. He says their mind is set on earthly things. Because if you didn't know Jesus, what else would your mind be set on? right? Like if you didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, naturally people who don't know them are going to think, I got to get everything out of this life because when it's done, it's done. But he says, but our citizenship, meaning people who believe in Jesus is in heaven and we eagerly, eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's in Philippians 3, uh, 19 through 20. Now, this is how it's had to work for me. So um, in the beginning, especially when I was young, I felt like your life is going to go on forever, right? Like it's a long time. I mean, you're 20 and people who are 40, Judas, that's, all, that's old, right? And so now you're 40 and you're thinking, I'm probably going to die in my 60s. So I got about 20 more years and life seems to be getting short. You know what I mean? Like as you age, the thought of how long your life is seems to get like, oh, maybe it is shorter. Maybe it is, you know, not so long. But here's what he tries to get us to understand. In all of the scope of eternity, your life is like this much. Whatever your number of days on this earth, your life is like this much. And here's, here's how I have to do this. So especially when I was younger, I, I'm a little bit of a control freak and I like things my way. Um, and so when little things would happen in my family, it would be like I would blow up. You know what I mean? Like my kids would do something and they tell the stories all the time. Do you remember when you kicked us all the way up the stairs for, like, do we have to really talk about these things in front of people? You know, but there was this deal. Like, I mean, it just, little things seemed to stress me out. But then as I got older, one of the things that I had to put in my mind is to remember this. And I always ask myself this question. Every time something happens, so in business or in, in life or something with my kids, will it matter 100 years from now? Will it matter 100 years from now? So when I get a call from one of the farms and this happened and, and I'm ready to just like blow up, I'm like, at the end of the day, will it matter 100 years from now? So I lost money or 
something got broke or somebody ran the truck into something or my kids did and then I, you know, I want to just react and I want to fix it. I want to make it different. Like at the end of the day, I got to remember my reaction. Here's what I got to think about. Should I get stressed about anything that's not going to matter a hundred years from now? Should we? In the light of eternity, should it matter? At the end of the day, a dent in my truck because somebody ran it into the concrete wall, should it matter? Well, it matters a little, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, should, it, should I, like, waste all of my energy and my time and my thought process? Like, oh, my gosh, I'm so upset and I'm so stressed out and I'm so worried because my car got a little bit dent in it? Because that's how I was. Like, it would, your whole mind is just thinking about it all the time. And I had to remind myself, you know, at the end of the day, it's fixable, right? Should it matter when people run jet skis into each other and they break? Well, maybe, but at the end of the day, it's just repairable. Are the people okay? See, in the beginning, I'd have been like, the jet ski, are you okay? The jet ski, right? Like, I spent a lot of money on this, but as you get older, you remember this. If, you're, if your life is just a dash, right, in the middle of it all, I got to care about the things that are going to matter 100 years from now. So I'm not going to waste my time being so caught up in the things that that, that are, are, are going to keep me off focus, and I got to think about the things that are going to last forever because this isn't my home, right? If the dent never gets fixed in the truck and the jet skis always stay broke, and you know what I mean? If all of those things happen, if I lose a little bit of money, if I make a little bit of money, if business fails or if business succeeds, at the end of the day, does it matter? A hundred years from now. Because no one's talking about it at your funeral, Right? Like nobody's talking about those kinds of things at your funeral. What they're talking about is who you had an impact on for Jesus Christ, right? Who you made a difference in uh, their life. And so uh, scripture says this to us, 2 Corinthians 4.18. This is something that should drive us. For the things we see now will soon be gone, right? That's the whole thing I was talking about. All of that stuff that I, that I think I care about, that stuff's going to be gone. But the, things, but the things we cannot see will last forever, Right? The things that the relationships and the life change and the things that you do for people, right? People are the only thing that matters at the end, right? Because they're the only thing that lasts. Everything else gets burned up. Everything else will be destroyed. The only thing that lasts is people and your relationships with them and if you help them understand who Jesus is. So this misconception, right, that this is your home and that, that everything on this earth should drive the things that we do isn't true. Like what should drive us is what will matter 100 years from now and what will matter 100 years from now is this and this is my hope for you. My hope for you is that you get called up to that golden gate a lot of times, right, to welcome in the people that you had influence on. Like, that's my hope for you. My hope for you is going to be like, hey, Jim, come on up. Here's another one, right? I need you to welcome in. You remember? And, and you're going to go to the gate, and you're going to be there to give them a hug, right? You're going to be there to welcome them into this place. That's my hope. At the end of the day that you made such a difference in your life that you're going to get called up to welcome in the people that you made a difference in because that's what's going to matter 100 years from now. Last misconception is this. Most people are going to heaven anyway. Right? Most people are going to heaven anyway. I think in this world, unfortunately, most people think that the default place of somebody who dies is heaven, which it's not. Right? Most people think the default place is if you're a good person, you live a good life, you don't hurt anybody, you, know, you don't take anything from anybody, you don't steal, you don't kill, you don't do, you know, if you don't do those things, then the default mode for good people is heaven. Just so we understand this, right? Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven, right? Don't allow your mind to be tricked into this idea that the de default place for every single person is heaven. Listen to what uh, scripture says. This is in Romans 3, 23 through 25. For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, I use this verse a lot when I tell people like you need to have a testimony, like, you should have a testimony. Like, you should be able to tell somebody, like, this is who I was, this is where Jesus saved me, and this is who I am today. And a lot of people's pushback is, well, I didn't really do anything bad in my life, so what could be my testimony? Well, your testimony is just what it said. How many people have sinned in this room? All. How many people have fallen short of the glory of God? All. Everybody has a testimony. Not one person in this room has, has lived up to the righteous standard that God has. Every person in this room, doesn't matter if your sin was 
being addicted to drugs or your sin just was telling a white lie. A sin is a sin in the eyes of God when it comes to righteousness. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. But this is what he tells us, right? So that's the problem, but he doesn't leave it with that. He says, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. So the answer to the problem is how do we get right with God? Right? He makes us right in his sight through grace, right? Like that's the way that you're made right with God is through grace. So he gives us the answer when he says this. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. God, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life by shedding his blood. So the band's going to come back up. And so I want you to, to think about this, okay? So when you process this idea, right, that, that where you're at in your journey, right, I never want anybody to find themselves at this place where, like, I don't really know, right? Like, I, I don't know, because the, the, the goal for me inside of, of this message was two things. So anybody that had feared death, right, like if, if you have a fear of death, I wanted that fear to go away, right? Like I wanted you to be able to, to walk away from this message and say, now because I understand eternity, I no longer have to fear death, right? Like nobody's like excited. I don't think anybody's here to be like, yeah, no, I mean, so excited to move on. Although now I hope with, with eternity at stake is, is that you can think of my days are numbered. And so when it's my last day, it's my last day. So I'm going to live and run the race. I always tell people this. It's not that I just want to be in the race. I want to run it. Not only do I want to run it, I don't want to arrive safely. Like the whole idea for me isn't to just make it through life and arrive safely at the gate. I want to come sliding in sideways. You know what I mean? Like I want to run the race it's so hard and so fast that at the end of it, there are no breaks, right? When I get to the end of it all, I'm going to come sliding in sideways. And so I don't fear that day. Like, I don't fear the day that, that my days are up. Like, I'm just going to keep running until my days are over. And when my days are over, I get to move on to the place prepared for me to be reunited with the ones that I love and hopefully to be reunited with all of you someday, right? Because of your decision. So the fear of death would go away but also your sense of urgency would go up. Right? For some of you in the room today, when I say sense of urgency, sense of urgency in this, that you don't know where you're going. Right, through all of this talk about eternity and what is it like and what's to come and what's judgment look like and what hell is and what heaven is and you're sitting there and you're like, I'm just, I'm unsure. And so for some of you, you're unsure because you're like, I don't know if God could really forgive me. You know what I mean? I don't know if I really deserve forgiveness and, and the things that I've done in my life. I don't know if that it can ever forgive those things. I want that fear to go away too because we know this. There is no condemnation in the Lord, right? That Jesus Christ died for every single person in this room. And so I hope for you, sense of urgency, that you will not walk out of this room today without making a decision, Right, that you won't walk out of here today thinking that oh, I'll have tomorrow to think about it and the next day to think about it. But I hope your sense of urgency has stepped up. And I hope for all of you who are saved today, but for every person in this room that is saved, your sense of urgency has went way up. Because there are many people in this world that you love who still don't know Jesus. There are many people in this world that, that you need to have a conversation with. There are many people in this world that you need to sit down and talk with. And I hope that through this, this understanding that it's all coming to an end and our days are numbered and that this is what eternity looks like, that you will step up that sense of urgency and have the conversation with the person you need to talk to. You know, don't just say it's, it's good to pray for people, but praying for someone that you're in relationship with without having a conversation with them is not good enough. It's just not. They're not going to get saved because you prayed for them. They're going to get saved because somebody talked to them, who gave them the option. Now, they're going to get saved because of Jesus. They're going to get saved because of their own decision. But understand, who brings them the gospel? How can they hear if no one is sent? How can they be saved if no one gives them the message? Whose responsibility is it to give them the message? You and me, right? So as you stand for this last song, I want to read this last scripture to you. 
And this last scripture, I think it's like an anthem for all of us to remember. A thing that, that Paul would say to everybody that comes to this place where they're thinking about eternity or have lost somebody, you know, to, that they have loved. He says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of what Jesus Christ did for us, because there is no sting in death anymore. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, letting nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor will not be in vain. So again, as we started this series, as we started this message, my hope as we leave here today that your view of eternity will change what you do tomorrow, will change what you do today, that your decisions, the way that you live your life, how you put your schedule together, what you do with your money, what you do with your resources, what you do in relationships, the conversations that you needed to have, and because you understand what eternity is, that it'll change the decisions you will make for the rest of your life. So thank you for being here with us this week and we look forward to seeing you again next week.